I'm Steve Liebman, and this is Blacktown, an outer western Sydney suburb. The population here is a mix of mainly working class families and unemployed young people living in public housing. But this seemingly typical suburb bears a scar that will never heal. It was in this district that one of Australia's most horrific crimes was committed. This was an outrage that horrified and inflamed the passions of ordinary Australians everywhere. The abduction, rape and murder of a woman described as a living angel. Please don't. Sydney nurse Anita Cobby. Blacktown is a bustling, growing satellite city, 41 kilometres west of the heart of Sydney. By the mid-80s, there is a growing crime and drug problem. Luckily, Gary and Grace Lynch have no such concerns with their children, daughters Anita, 25, and Catherine, 20. Gary has worked hard all his life as a graphic artist with the Air Force. Grace has enjoyed a long career as a nursing sister. Anita has chosen to follow her mother into nursing. She didn't always want to be a nurse, but um, somehow uh, she decided uh, she wanted to do something with her life and, uh, and she became a nurse and she really enjoyed it. She, she really loved it. She was a beautiful person. Um, she'd grown up into a beautiful young lady. She was the quintessence of dignity. Yeah, that'll be it. Julia Shepherd is the author of the best-selling book about Anita Cobby called Someone Else's Daughter and will become a close confidant of the Lynch family. She'd been married to John Cobby. She had been married for several years to John and he was a nurse as well. <clears throat> and they'd been travelling around Europe. And when they got back, things fell apart a little bit and they decided to separate. <clears throat> and even though they were separating, um, they remained good friends. And so Anita had moved back home to her parents' place until she got on her feet and worked out what she was going to do with her life. In the mid-80s, Lynn Bradshaw joins the nursing staff at Sydney Hospital and vividly recalls meeting the woman who will become one of her closest friends. Anita was generally interested in people. She, she loved people. Uh, you know, patients weren't just an appendix or a heart attack. She knew, she knew how many children they had. She knew their grandchildren's names, um, knew what they did for a living. She loved people, was interested in people. It's Sunday, February 2nd, 1986. Anita Cobby has just finished her day shift in the surgical ward of Sydney Hospital and has arranged to go to dinner with her friends and colleagues, Lynn Bradshaw and Elaine Bray. We got changed and, and headed off up to a Lebanese restaurant that uh, Anita knew of. Um, stopped at the bottle shop, got some wine and um, headed out to dinner. Had a great time, three of us, just sit, talking, making plans, you know, generally being three young women, giggling, you know, all that kind of stuff. And um, then we, we left. It wasn't a late night. Um, we said goodbye to Elaine and I asked Anita if she wanted to lift to the station and um, I drove her to the station. Thank you so much. Please she said, I'll see you tomorrow. You. I said, yeah, I'll see, see you then. Yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. Bright and early. <laughs> Bye. Bye. See ya. And that was the last words we spoke. She walked off to catch the train home. On the other side of town, 40 kilometres away, five young men, all with troubled lives and each with a string of criminal convictions, are drinking at the pub. All five live in relatively squalid conditions in a public housing estate in the Doonside area, a high unemployment precinct adjacent to Blacktown. That's the way to go, son. John Travers, 18, is the leader of the Gang of Five. Yeah, nice, Travers. He has a long history of drug abuse, violent assault and cruelty to animals. Many times he and his mates have assaulted young women 
and indulged in gay bashing. All right, take it. Travers considers his violent nature to be a badge of honour. Michael Murdoch, also 18, idolises Travers and copies his every move, including body piercing and tattoos. He too has a string of convictions such as car theft, burglary and drug possession. The other three at the hotel that night are brothers, the Murphy boys. The oldest, Michael, yeah, is a prison it. escapee. He'd previously spent 10 years in jail for armed robbery and is serving an eight-year sentence for burglary and larceny when he escapes from <laughs> Silverwater Prison. How's that? On this particular yeah, okay. night, two months later, he is still on the run. His younger brothers, Gary and Les, are following in their older brother's footsteps. They too have a litany of criminal convictions, drugs, stealing, assault, all the usual street crimes. John Travers often takes his sexual activities to an unimaginable and frightening level, even with animals. Mate, I needed earplugs for that shit. He was known for buying sheep or getting a sheep. His party trick was to jump on the sheep. I had one fellow tell me that he'd had sex with a sheep, cut its throat and then he would roast it on a spit in the backyard. And, and he would do that regularly. A complaint had been made against him and Western Australia police were, were chasing him but he'd eluded them where he'd raped a young, um, a, a teenage boy there um, with others and was on the run. But it was quite a savage rape and uh, the, the victim required hospital treatment. Get some Although well fired up by alcohol, the group still isn't satisfied and seeks further gratification through drugs. As they climb into the car to pick up the drugs, they eventually realise that between them, they can't even rustle up enough money to put petrol in the near empty stolen car. They decide to rob someone. But there's more fun to be had. In an evil pact, they agree that rape will be part of the night's entertainment. Meanwhile, Anita Covey's train is wending its way towards Blacktown. What happens next will send shockwaves through an entire nation. Anita Covey and the Gang of Five have never met, but tragically, their paths are about to converge, their worlds about to collide. It's almost 10 o'clock on Sunday night, February the 2nd, 1986, and 25-year-old nurse Anita Cobby has finished her shift at Sydney Hospital and is arriving at her destination, Blacktown Station, 40 kilometres west of Sydney. The family home is about two kilometres away. She did attempt to ring her dad, but the phones were out. And there weren't any taxis at the the cab rank, so she decided to walk home, which was around about a half an hour walk. And I often think of her walking along the streets away from Blacktown Railway Station, and I think because she'd grown up there, and it was a hot summer's night, and she felt very comfortable in her own area, it was her own territory, and I don't think she would have sensed any danger um, walking away from the station that night. She was in the wrong place at the wrong time. She was walking home, minding her own business. We had the car full of, of uh, the Murphys and Murdoch and Travers. Michael Murphy was an escapee from jail. Travers was mad, uh, violent, would do anything. The five men are hell-bent on violence and more than willing to follow Travers' lead. They spot Anita and decide she's the one. Mickey, do what you got next to her, in front. Get her, mate, get her! Get her, mate! Get her! Right! Got her! Two jump out and grab her. Kicking and screaming, she's dragged into the car. 
Shut up, bitch. They were driving around the car after they got her and they stripped her off pretty well straight away um, in the back of the car. They punched her, her face was, nose was broken, both the cheekbones had um, abrasions on them. While Anita is being brutalised in the back of the car, they brazenly pull into a service station. Someone holds a knife at her throat, tells her to be quiet. Lays her down on the floor behind the front seats. And uh, someone fills up with petrol. Nothing in here. Where is it, bitch? They go to a handbag, they took the money out of her purse. Paid for the petrol. And then went down to Green Park to her to carry on with it. A paddock down there in Reen Road here at Prospect, a semi-rural area near Blacktown, is well known to these men. They know that it's poorly lit and that the surrounding area is largely uninhabited. It's a well-known lover's lane and a dumping place for stolen cars or worse. This is where the abductors have decided to take an already terrified and brutalised Anita Cobby. Anita's nightmare may well have ended back at Newton Road from where she was snatched, but fate has conspired against her. She came so very, very close to um, getting help because there was a, a young girl, a 13-year-old girl and her brother at home who heard the screams in a house almost directly adjacent to where she was dragged in. And they ran outside hey! and saw the hey! car, saw what was happening. Hey! Let her go! And Let her go! the car disappeared into the darkness. Their brother, Paul McGoy, arrives hey, home hey, a few minutes right. later. There's a car, a car pulled up just there. Like, I think it was like an old hole. They've yeah, taken yeah. a girl, they've pulled up. They've, they've pulled taken, up, a taken a girl. They, they dragged right her into the car and they've, they've right taken her off up that way. Straight up that way. You called the cops. I've called the cops. They've taken her right I spoke to um, my brother and sister. And, uh, they were hysterical of what they've, they've seen. My sister saw uh, Anita get dragged into the car. And my brother uh, attempted to, um, to he chased the vehicle and barefoot and tried to be, open the rear door. Uh, he almost got there, but the car took off. I uh, decided to go look for Anita while my brother and sister waited for the police. And uh, I drove around uh, a few locations and I drove down uh, a lover's lane, as they call it, Green Road. And uh, passed a couple of cars on the left-hand side. Went down, i done a U-turn. I had a spotlight out at the time and come across a empty HT Holden on the uh, side of the road. And I had the uh, spotlight in the paddock looking around to see if I could see anyone. Shut up. Uh, little did I know that they were lying down, uh, hiding from me, hiding in the grass uh, from my lights. Paul mistakenly believes that the car he's spotted is not the one he's searching for. He believes he's looking for a different model Holden. He heads home to check on his brother and sister. Local police attend Newton Road, take several statements, including one from another witness, and they make a report, but nothing comes of it that night. Now, feeling free to commit whatever atrocities they want, the five men violate and torture Anita at will. I think by the time she got down there, one if not two, they probably already had sex with her in the car. 
she'd been forced through the barbed wire fence rather than thrown over it or helped over it. Absolutely dragged through it. Come on! Get up. She had defensive wounds where she tried to stop doing what they were doing with the knife. Um, she grabbed the knife and they pulled it out of her hand. She likes it. Look at her, she loves it. Knuckles and her fingers were broken. They had uh, anal and uh, vaginal sex with her. <laughs> Nothing more worse that you could think of. <laughs> they were talking about whether they should let her go or what should happen. And it was decided because she had heard their names and that she'd seen their faces that she couldn't, she couldn't live. What the hell are we going to do? <sighs> hey, do your thing, Travis. Yeah, do your thing, mate. Yeah. Do your yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> do that. Go on, mate. She knows their names. <laughs> she was lying face down at that point, and John Travis jumped on her back, grabbed her by the back of the head. She was conscious at that time because Joe Malouf, the coroner, said that she had defence wounds on her hand and she put a hand up to stop that knife and he'd almost severed several of her fingers. Please, John. Please. Travers commits the final atrocity. The job done, he rushes back to his mates. Quick, go. Have a drink. Had a few, mate. Like nothing. <laughs> their bloodlust satisfied, the five men are now concerned for their welfare. They decide to get rid of all the evidence except for Anita Cobby's body. That's better shit. <laughs> With Anita's clothes still in the car, they drive to John Travers' home at Doonside. They light a fire in the backyard and burn them. Great night, eh? <laughs> they later scrape up the ashes and get rid of them. I'll certainly have my game. Unbeknownst to them, a neighbour is peering over the fence. They then drive off in the stolen car and later abandon it burnt out in nearby bushland. They're now satisfied there is nothing to tie them to Anita Cobby's cold-blooded murder. It's close to midnight on Sunday, February 2nd, 1986, and Gary Lynch is still awake wondering why Anita hasn't arrived home. Maybe she stayed with friends in Sydney, but why hasn't she called? Gary walks to the window and peers into the night. Now I saw this cloud. As I looked at it, it, it formed into a fiendish, goalish uh, face. It's absolutely sadistic. Uh, couldn't couldn't understand why, why I was experiencing this. It was like the, uh, the face of all evil, if you could imagine. Lynn Bradshaw experiences her own psychic phenomenon that night. And I woke about 11 o'clock in, in an absolute cold sweat. I'd had this dream. Um, I couldn't see Anita, but I could hear her voice. And we were, again, having a banter, just... Um, I'm not coming to work tomorrow. And I said, why? Why aren't you coming to work tomorrow? And she said, I'm dying. And I said, don't be stupid, you know, you, you come to work tomorrow. And she said, no, Lynn, I'm dying. And with that, that's when I woke up. And it doesn't sound scary, but I was an absolute cold sweat. Um, I got out of bed. I remember I checked under the beds. I checked the windows. I checked the doors. I was absolutely terrified. Um, when I checked with the police later, I found that around 11, 11.30 was the time she was killed. So it was, yeah, it was awful. The next morning, Grace Lynch looks into her daughter's bedroom. And uh, I said to Gary in the morning, Anita didn't come home. 
Uh, she probably stayed with friends, which she did from time to time, especially if she was working late and had to start early in the morning. But um, she, it wasn't due to start until the afternoon the next day and, um, and she had decided to come home and, so that she could have a sleep, good sleep. At Sydney Hospital, alarm bells are ringing. Anita was very reliable. Um, I've had phone calls from Anita when she thought she was going to be late for work. So to not turn up, um, to not be at home, um, to not have let anybody know where she was, was, was not like her. Um, and I just had that awful feeling. And then we knew something had happened. And so um, uh, <clears throat> I said to Gary, we have to go and report it to the police, which we did. Gary Lynch's deep concern is felt by the constable here at Blacktown, who takes the missing persons report. The young officer is stunned when he looks at a photo of Anita and realises they went to school together. But soon, every Australian, like that young policeman, will feel a personal grief and revulsion over this horrendous crime. It's 11am on Tuesday, February 4th, 1986. A farmer, John Reen, notices his cows milling inquisitively around an object in his paddock at Prospect. Investigating, he is horrified by his discovery. I just couldn't believe it was a human there laying in the paddock. I thought it was, you know, a doll or something at first. Detective Sergeant Graham Rosetta, a highly experienced and dedicated investigator attached to Blacktown detectives, is one of the first called to the scene. Two things that stick out of my mind. One, the... the uh, it is gash across the throat and uh, the, the uh, look on, on, on her face, the, uh, the look of agony on, on, on her face and uh, oh, there are obviously other marks on the body but these are the two things that, uh, that uh, stand out, the fact that she was so helpless. Homicide and crime scene investigators are called in. I think the thing that struck me most was uh, that uh, um, her head was, um, or her neck was very severely lacerated and uh, at one stage when the examiner rolled the body over to uh, have a look at uh, um, the, the frontal section of the body that uh, the head was very, very loose, uh, tactically attached to the uh, torso. So it was more or less as if her, her uh, neck and head had been uh, completely severed. And that was a fairly um, traumatic um, thing to look at. Took a ring off her fingers. That was the only significant uh, um, object that was found in the area. Not even an ounce of clothing, nothing at all. But this Russian interlocking wedding ring on her finger. The moment the officer who took the original missing person report hears that a female body's been found, he fears the worst and rushes to the scene with Anita's photograph. He approaches Homicide Detective Constable Gary Heskett. Ian and I looked at the photograph and the body and we had no doubt in our mind that it was the same person. So armed with this information and an address, uh, we decided then to head off over to Sullivan Street, Blacktown to speak to the parents. All the police training in the world never seems to prepare one for these sad and sorrowful dark occasions. They, they had a, a, a wedding ring. Our daughter was here at the time, our, our daughter Catherine, and uh, she identified it, the, 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 the ring. Detectives also interview Anita's estranged husband, John Cobby, and he confirms the ring is the one he'd given his wife at their wedding. We then had to do the formal identification of the body at the morgue. Detective Kenny and I discussed who was the stronger, Gary or Grace. We both decided it was Gary's job to go and identify the body. I could see they were upset, very uh, agitated, fearful of my uh, reactions. And I said uh, to them, I said, now look, I want you to understand that if this is as bad as it's beginning to look, 
rest assured that we will see it through. We'll see it through to the very end. At some stage, his legs buckled under him, and I remember Gary Heskett and myself just grabbed hold of him and held him upright, and uh, um, then he, he composed himself, and he said, I wish I... Uh, I wish it was, I could say it was somebody else's daughter, couldn't I? But then they'd have to go through what we're going through. The matron at Sydney Hospital breaks the news to the nursing staff. It was like walking to the gallows, just walking, and you knew, but you hoped. And, and as we walked into the matron's office, there was Marilyn sitting there, and she'd obviously been crying. And I walked in, and the matron had obviously been crying. And um, I think I was screaming before she told me anything. A 20-man investigation team consisting of local and homicide detectives set up headquarters on the first floor here at Blacktown Police Station. They begin the hard slog of canvassing the crime scene and the entire area around the train station. They check Anita's last movements and the files of all known sex offenders, as well as tracking the movement of local taxi drivers and the whereabouts of anyone who knew her. Did she catch a taxi? Did she accept a lift? Or in fact, did she walk? Meanwhile, detectives suggest that a grieving Gary Lynch visits the scene of his daughter's murder. There was actually a, a little area where there was, I, I believe, some of her blood on the grass. Yeah. That, that I, I wanted to grab that, and put it in my pocket and take it home, but I couldn't. I just had to look at it, know what it was and uh, go away with a heavy heart. Yeah. Detectives discover a written report that several members of the public heard screaming and saw a woman being dragged into a Holden sedan in Newton Road at about 9.50 on the night of Anita's disappearance. Shut up, bitch. <laughs> After interviewing those witnesses, including the McGoys, they're confident it was Anita and that she must have walked home. Let it go! Detective Gary Raymond is one of the investigators. But at this point in time, we didn't know who they were or where they were. And the real fear that we had, and we're looking at, we're looking at each other saying, you know, are these, these offenders going to offend again? The media descends en masse and has become aware of some of the gruesome details of the murder. As a consequence, a stunned and angry public also learns of the barbaric final moments of the nurse and much-loved local charity queen. Even the then Premier, Neville Rann, who had once crowned Anita Miss Western Suburbs, becomes personally involved demanding constant updates from police. They decide to invite the media to a reenactment of Anita's train ride and attempted walk home. It prompts an avalanche of calls, but none offers a breakthrough. Then an informant gives detectives a piece of information that will eventually prove vital. He tells police that a car similar to the one described in the abduction had been stolen and used by Les Murphy, Michael Murdoch, and John Travers. This is the first time their names are thrown up. A background check reveals Travers' extremely violent nature. The informant tells detectives that the stolen car has very distinctive chrome wheels. They also believe that the car has been dumped and burned in Powers Road. Police are given a council ranger's report and photograph of that burnt out car. But when they go to Powers Road, they find that the vehicle has been removed. Investigators decide it's now time to question Travers, Murdoch, and Les Murphy. And so they organize a series of raids. They find the distinctive chrome wheels on Les Murphy's car. I need to know more about that knife. It had blood on it and it was at your home. It's for killing sheep. I kill sheep with it. Detective Sergeant Rosetta recalls a most chilling interview with John Travers, particularly when he brings up the subject of a knife found at his Doonside home smeared with animal blood. I don't believe you, John. He, he made a denial in, in, in words that I will never forget. 
I didn't touch yeah, the... His denial was something which, uh, which, which probably went more to convincing you of his, of, his, of his guilt than anything else. And he, he came out and said... I didn't slit that slut's throat! And uh, his use of the word slut um, was something that, that, that made my mind up anyway, that uh, John Travers had in, in, in actual fact had been, uh, been the, uh, the main perpetrator. I didn't slit that slut's throat. All right then. All three are charged with car theft. They claim to have been at home watching television on the night of Anita Cobby's murder. I was at home watching TV. John Travers is kept in custody. Michael Murdoch and Les Murphy are released on bail and are placed under 24-hour surveillance. Officers discover a bizarre plot to free Travers. Senior homicide detective Kevin Rowie is part of the investigating team. Uh, he attempted to, uh, to arrange uh, with Leslie Murphy and others uh, false passports. Um, um, bizarre as it sounds, they, they talked about arranging for a derailment of a train at the back of the Blacktown Police Station to create a diversion. Now, clearly they weren't intending to escape uh, because of a stolen car. Uh, so clearly uh, our belief and our suspicion, uh, if you like, was confirmed. Meanwhile, from his cell, John Travers makes a simple request of the supervising officer at Blacktown Police Station, a seemingly innocuous request that will blow the case wide open and leave an outraged public screaming for blood. The abduction and barbaric torture, rape and murder of Sydney nurse Anita Cobby has set in motion not only a massive police investigation, it has sparked fury and anger from an outraged public. All sections of the media play a vital role in keeping the horrific crime in the public's conscience. I feel very angry and bitter, I think. Uh, at first, of course, you felt sympathy, and then that changed straight away to sort of an anger, I think, more than anything. Police have charged three men with car theft, a car they believe is linked to the murder. However, two of them, Les Murphy and Michael Murdoch, have been bailed and are under 24-hour surveillance. John Travers remains in custody. Detectives are certain all three have been involved in Anita's murder, but as yet, they don't have enough evidence. You're lying, John. Then, a simple and innocuous request sets in motion some amazing events. Can you call my auntie up, tell her to bring me down some smokes? What's the number? Travers asks the duty sergeant to contact a female acquaintance to bring him some cigarettes. The sergeant gives the woman's phone number to Detective Kevin Rowie. He calls the woman and arranges to meet Detective her. Detective Rowie from Blacktown Police. Later that evening, uh, I travelled to a, a sporting club in Wentworthville, a, a nearby suburb, and I was able to meet, uh, meet with this person uh, in, in the car park um, and had a, a very enlightening conversation with, uh, with her in relation to uh, the person Travers and some of his associates. She talked about um, uh, what she believed to have been sexual assaults committed by the person Travers, uh, and she talked about his attitude towards women uh, and some of his um, rather strange and, and, uh, and disturbing behaviour uh, regarding involving violence <coughs> um, and the use of, of knives. She effectively told me that she believed although she didn't know uh, that Travers was involved in the murder. The woman is well known to Travers and she's terrified of him. But she bravely agrees to deliver the cigarettes to his cell and report back to police if he says anything of significance. Uh, after the conversation finished, I met her back at the police station door, allowed her into the station, uh, took her to the rear of the station and she collapsed. It was quite emotional. Um, we carried her up the stairs to the uh, detective office. And she was shaking like a leaf. She turned around and she said, it's, it's them. It's him. It's him. 
to Michael Murdoch. And she gave us a list of names of the others. Gary Murphy and Michael Murphy. It's all of them, they all did it. What we needed to do then was to get what was said on paper, get a statement from her saying exactly what the conversation had taken place, what information she could give us. So we had that, but that statement then just becomes her word against his without any corroboration. So we, uh, the next step was then that we applied or I applied for a um, listening device so that she would wear a recorder and uh, our intention was to send her back in if she was willing to do it to see if we could get her again to strike up a conversation with him where he volunteered information on the murder. She, she agreed. The woman becomes known as Miss X. Her life is in extreme danger and she becomes a protected witness. What you're about to hear for the first time are excerpts of the actual confession of a cold-blooded killer. Some of the taped admissions are far too gruesome to broadcast. We've substituted Miss X's voice to protect her identity. John, come close. Why? Why'd you have to stop her? We're all drunk. She like I'm saying all of us. She saw your face, yeah? She got all their names when I would just... She got your name. And you knew? Yeah, they said you had to do it. They said it had to be done. You? You all agreed. That's not your thing, John, is it? You haven't done it before, have you? Truthfully, that that's the first. Don't laugh, it's not funny, John. Investigators now have all the evidence they need to make arrests. In a series of nighttime raids, they snare Michael Murdoch and Les Murphy, but Gary and Michael Murphy are nowhere to be found. Back at Blacktown Police Station, the interrogations are intense. Michael Murdoch and Les Murphy finally crack and tell all. Fine, all right. We did what we did. It's Travers. Travers cut a throat. When Detective Sergeant Rosetta confronts Travers with the details of their confessions, Travers glares and asks... He gave us up. Was it Les? Did Les give us up? Their story was, and Travers' story was also, that... Follow after they'd raped her, they suddenly decided that uh, she would have to be killed because there was the possibility she could identify them. Do you think, Travis? Yeah, do you think, mate? Yes. Yes. Do you think? Yes. So they killed her. <coughs> I have always been the, the, the belief that it was more than likely the intention to not only rape, abduct and rape a woman that, that night, but. <laughs> They were prepared no. simply by the fact that Travers had this, this knife uh, with him. They were prepared to go one step further and, and commit a murder that same night. Uh, so what I'm saying is I don't believe that it was simply a matter of out of fear of being identified that they, they uh, decided that she had to die. Although they've ditched the knife, which is never found, Travers tells them where he bought it. Detectives then buy a similar knife, and Travers agrees it's like the one he used to kill Anita. She's a beauty, isn't she? It's 4 a.m. on February 24th when Detective Sergeant Ian Kennedy phones Grace and Gary Lynch and suggests they get up and put the kettle on. He's coming around with some important information. So I knocked on the door and uh, went in, and I just said, look, I've got some good news for you. We've just charged three men with Anita's murder murder um, and the worst part is there's another two we've got two more to get and we're looking for them I thought my god our little girl five monsters you know because that's what they were 
At first light, police take the three men individually to the scene of the crime, where each recounts in minute detail exactly what had occurred. A few hours later, radio stations break the news. Three men have finally been charged with Anita Cobby's murder. Police are still hunting two more. We got them out all right, but when we were coming back to the police station, uh, the crowds were 10 and 15 deep. Um, from the driveway to the police station, up the road, people along the streets, people hanging over the edges of buildings on the rooftop car parks with a noose hanging down with signs. Let the public fix them! Um, and as we inched forward through this um, gap of people, they were rocking the car and banging their fists on the window. And, I mean, it was, it was just mob violence. But it was, it, was, it was quite scary, really quite square, scary. At noon, Leslie Joseph Murphy, John Raymond Travers and Michael James Murdoch appear in Blacktown local court, charged with the abduction and murder of Anita Lorraine Cobby at Prospect on February 2nd, 1986. They're remanded without bail, while the hunt for Michael and Gary Murphy intensifies. Their descriptions are circulated Australia-wide and in all national media. On February 26th, after a series of tip-offs from members of the public, police raid a house at Glenfield in Sydney's southwest. As soon as we kicked the door in, Gary Murphy ran out the back of the house. Um, I understand he ran into the backyard and ran into a fairly large swash fellow who threw him against the fence on the ground. They jumped on him and. and handcuffed him. Michael Murphy was sitting on the lounge uh, just looking at me holding a little baby. Handcuffed, Michael and Gary Murphy are driven to Blacktown where they too are charged with the abduction and murder of Anita Cobby. Again, detectives Kennedy and Heskett call the lynchers to break the news. We've got them all. On February 2nd, 1986, Sydney nurse Anita Cobby is abducted, tortured, raped and murdered. When police charge five men with the crime, public emotions boil over with mass demonstrations calling for the killers to be executed. There are also angry crowds outside the Westmead Coroner's Court two months later, when the five are brought in under armed guard for the brief committal hearing. The small courtroom is packed. One of the many onlookers, Anita's father, Gary, it's the first time he's come face to face with Anita's killers. Their heads were hung. They looked as if they were ashamed. Well, well they could have been because uh, I don't suppose I was a great sight to see for, for it ever. But uh, we went through it, got that over. It's another five months before Travers, Murdoch and the three Murphy brothers appear in the Glebe Coroner's Court for a full committal hearing. They all plead not guilty, despite having already made admissions. And for Grace Lynch, it's the first time she will lay eyes on her daughter's killers. It was very harrowing, but it was something we had to do. Uh, otherwise, Anita would have been just another murder victim. And uh, we... We cared and uh, we want to, wanted to know the details of what had happened to her. And uh, it, it, so it was, um, it was very hard. The brave John, Miss X, who has coaxed a taped confession from John Travers, Why? has had death threats from friends of Travers, and she's now in the witness protection program. Derek Hand is the coroner hearing the committal case. Oh. <laughs> Defendants couldn't care less. Their demeanour was uh, as if it's all a big joke. But they showed no emotion uh, other than, um, you know, a bit of a laugh. 
this is what I think this is what made it even worse for the public uh, was their, their lack of uh, appear and appearing to be remorseful. They didn't even appear to be remorseful. You know, they just um, carried on. The coroner also hears evidence that although bloodstains have been found on clothing seized from Travers and Murdoch and on several of Travers' knives, its blood type can't be established. When a terrified Miss X enters the witness box, she's just metres away from John Travers. Travers is seething and doesn't even try to hide his hatred for her. He said, yeah, that's why I had to kill her. He was looking at her with hate in his eyes and he was muttering something and really, really tense. And I nudged Kevin Rowie and I said, just keep your eye on Travis. You bitch! And next minute he just lunged for her, yelling out. We intercepted him, grabbed him and just pushed him back and someone else got her and got her away. We thought that she wouldn't come back in and give evidence. We thought that she was so scared then that she just uh, couldn't go back in. But I think it backfired on him in the sense uh, she went back and was strong as ever. March 16th, 1987, a year and 40 days since Anita Cobby was found dead. The trial finally begins before Justice Maxwell at the New South Wales Supreme Court. John Travers springs a surprise. He changes his plea to guilty. He knows the evidence against him is overwhelming. Travers is remanded in custody for sentencing. The trial of the others continues. The lynchers attend every day of the two-month trial and endure all the gruesome details, as well as the callous attitude of the defendants. It, it, was, uh, it, it was just horrific. Uh, it's just something I can't um, imagine anyone doing to another human being. Mm. I just, it's just something that um, it's beyond, beyond my thinking. My uh, main concern was uh, Anita's father. I could not work him out. Uh, he was so calm, so cool. Uh, I expected him to explode. Uh, at any minute. The jury of seven men and five women are also sickened by the evidence and become even more disturbed when they visit the paddock in Reen Road where Anita had spent the final tortured moments of her life. After 54 days of gruesome testimony, the jury retires to consider its verdict. 10.20 on the morning of Wednesday, June 10th, 1987. It's standing room only at the Supreme Court after word comes through that the jury has reached its decision. The atmosphere is electric as an anxious public gathers outside the court. Inside, the lynchers, police and the media hold their breath. Then, the moment of truth. The foreman rises. When the charges against Michael Murdoch and Les, Gary and Michael Murphy are read out, the foreman repeats one word, guilty. I had been in a lot of courtrooms when sentences were handed down. I had never, ever heard in my life the thunder and applause that happened in that courtroom. Um, the building, the floor shook, um, people clapped and cheered. Justice Maxwell um, very, very quickly uh, got the court to stop and told them that it was inappropriate. But there was just jubilation. And I remember leaving the courtroom and there was a bus driver and he um, skipped out of the courtroom and he was um, smiling and happy and clapping and talking to everyone. It was like it was a personal victory for him. And this was someone who didn't even know the Lynch family, who didn't know anyone connected with the case, but he'd just been coming in on odd days. Um, and he said he was very relieved and jubilant about the, the verdict. Outside the court, there's jubilation at the news. Finally, the ordeal of the trial is over and the lynchers express their relief. They also thank police and the public. We feel that uh, true justice has shown itself.
very proud of all the people who have been connected with this case and our daughter. I just feel relieved and, uh, and that justice will be done for Anita. She was the victim of a prolonged and sadistic physical assault. It's six days later and all five killers appear again before an emotional Justice Maxwell for sentencing. Wild animals are given to pack assaults and killings. However, they do so for the purposes of survival. And he sums up the evidence and then says in part, passion. not so these prisoners. They assaulted in a pack for the purpose of satisfying their lust and kill for the purpose of identification. <clears throat> this is one of the most horrifying physical and sexual assaults I've encountered in 40 odd years associated with the law. His honour then looks at each defendant and in sentencing each prisoner to life on the murder charge, he says, the circumstances of each prisoner and the circumstances of Anita Lorraine Cobby's murder prompt me to recommend that the files of each prisoner be clearly marked never to be released. Absolute elation around the world, I think around Australia, it was just people cheering, people, people crying. They were just so happy that these, these guys were off the streets forever. Um, and justice, well, some degree of justice had been done and they couldn't do it to anyone else. And um, I guess a feeling of safety that, that people could walk the streets again because these guys were gone. So um, it was good, it was a good feeling. It may be 20 years since Anita Cobby's life was so cruelly taken but she still remains in the hearts and minds of many Australians who never met her, but took her death so personally. There is pain, there is uh, well, hurt. Uh, at times there's even agony. It's only brief, but it hits you and, oh boy, it's like a rapier going through your heart, you know. And, uh, but you, you know it's going to come, you can't avoid it, and, and you've got to just brace yourself. And, ooh, here it goes. A long, jagged, searing hurt. But it doesn't kill you. <laughs> it doesn't kill you. I think what it does is it uh, steals you for a... Uh... And out of it you become, you, you just become stronger, you become a stronger person. Well, what it does, it and, says... And, and you find that little things, uh, like... little, little traumas are nothing.